you come to worship and we have one of the events in all of biblical history to, uh, to share today, the Transfiguration. Um, so that is uh, one of those stories that you can pretty much show over and over and over, and I probably do that every year, a major event in the life of the church. Um, and let's see, Miss B. Young is our uh, lay worship leader this morning. May our Lord's peace be with you. With you also. Hey, good morning. My name is Miss D. Young, and I'm your lay leader today. Uh, welcome to First Christian Church, either here uh, physically or online. We welcome you as well. Um, are there any announcements this morning from the floor? Wes? Once again, I just want to bring uh, to all the men's attention the men's retreat coming up in March. There are um, registration forms in the fellowship hall hanging on the bulletin board. If you would like to go, uh, the registration forms are there. Uh, we're looking forward to it. It should be a good time going up on a Friday and coming back on a Saturday. So uh, everybody's invited. Well, maybe. Huh? The yes. The if, I, I, I'm not being uh, sexist. All doesn't mean all. <laughs> but that's okay because March 2nd, the women are meeting here painting uh, uh, birdhouses. So we can, we'll, we'll do our event first. <laughs> okay, so we've got, we've got a men's retreat in March, and we also have our CWF women's luncheon uh, March the 2nd. <coughs> and, we're, and the women are, are not building. We're not building anything. We're going to paint. <laughs> we're painting bird houses. <laughs> Jan. You do have board meeting after the service today, so please come to the podium and come over for a way we can get it done. Um, also, we still do have the regional assembly that's coming up April 11th, 26th, 27th, and 28th, whatever that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday is. It's in here. I hope it feels closer than it normally is. meeting today after church, and then we're gearing up for the regional assembly as well at the end of April. Jim. Well, I heard you guys had a lot of good help, too. What's that? Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> um, I was also going to say I heard you had good help as well. Good help in the kitchen. Lots of help. So that was really good to hear, too. Audrey. Uh, let's go. It's almost that time here with Easter coming. Just the lilies and things. I think what I'm going to do on um, a donation towards the flowers again because it worked out really good with the poinsettias. So after... This week, probably next week or so, I'll be starting to collect any money going again for it. Uh, and also, I have a bulletin board over there now, which I'll have for over in the fellowship hall, right this corner, uh, announcing anything, sign up list, and all that, because we will be having here and there stuff going on. So, so feel free to look at that. And there is a mirror hanging up there, and if you want to know what the mirror is about, You'll have to go there and look into it. You'll find out what it's all about. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, oh, I know what I was going to say about your bulletin board. I saw you had sign-ups for the flower? Flower, flower sign-ups yeah, for the for the for Easter, right? Yes. And then I know I noticed you had the fifth Sunday singing sign-up. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. And if you have a song for the future. Now, um, Easter Sunday is our fifth Sunday of the month. Uh, we will not be having singing Sunday that day, but in the future, if you have a song, put it up there on that list, and I can give it to Mary. That way, uh, you know, it'll work out throughout the, the whole year. Yes. Okay. <coughs> yeah, she's worked really hard on that, on her part of the bulletin board there. That looks really nice. Yes. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. 
okay. Oh, yeah, on Valentine's Day. So you get to bring your date to church before you can go to dinner, right? Is that the way it works, Roger? Maybe, or maybe go to dinner and then come to Ash Wednesday. Whichever, right? Just be here. Okay, they have Ash Wednesday service on Valentine's Day this year. So, two, ho two holidays in one. <laughs> All right, well, with that, let us prepare for worship. of the Lord is in this place. I can feel his mighty power and his grace. I can feel the rush of angels' wings as he wore me on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. From the rising of the sun to the, to the setting, God speaks to us and summons us. God gathers us in covenant. God's glory shines forth. Let us remain standing. Um, and we're going to sing verse, I'm sorry, hymn number 64. We sing your mighty power, O God. We're singing verses 1 and 2. catch up with each other, share our graces and joys before we uh, focus on our prayer concerns. Okay, Tina McCormick. Trophies, that's probably the trophy is bigger than she is. Well, That's when it's good to be negative, yes. <laughs> yes. 
Kathy? So we had news from the Louisiana Weathers. Jane got his assignment. He'll be flying the 757ER out of Atlanta. Yay. And he goes, I think he starts tomorrow. He starts training tomorrow. Orientation. And wow. Yep. 757. Not that it's a weathers competition, but that's a bigger plane, isn't it? Wes? <laughs> it's uh, smaller than the 76, but uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> bigger than you started. Yeah. Much. Yeah. Oh, wow. so, I have a, a phrase that um, yeah. is shared from uh, Deb Dixon. Um, she uh, has had uh, AFAM, I guess, an ongoing problem. Yeah, and um, was almost set up for her, what you said, seventh or eighth cardio version? Ninth. Ninth, actually. Okay, yeah. And when she was uh, hooked up, uh, it had disappeared. So miracles like that are, uh, are wonderful, and, and we certainly celebrate that. Thank everybody for your prayers. Yes. Great to see you, uh, you folks back today. So. Okay. Uh, yes, Jordan. Uh, Kim Self texted me this morning and said that her mom, Jean, should be coming home. Yes. She's yes, she is. Um, day after uh, Ash Wednesday and Valentine's Day. Um, so um, it's been a long go for her. So but that's uh, definitely a reason to celebrate there. Um, let's see. Joe, you said you had something? Yeah, Roger. In 1965, I was an elder in the Student church I was serving in the mountains wrote a pencil letter to my home church and said, Ordain this guy, I need him to marry my brother. Uh, <laughs> so I, I was starting in the ministry, and fortunate for me, in 53, I married a young lady, <laughs> and we're in our Starting in our 91st year of fighting, or 71st year, excuse me. <laughs> Five children, 14 grandchildren, and no families, and now eight great grandchildren, and all kinds of things to do in the years I've worked in ministry. I couldn't make a one step without her. She was 91 this week, and so I just want to acknowledge that as my indebtedness and my thankfulness. For having such a lady in my life. Wow. Yeah, not very many make it to the uh, 9070 Club, so, and an and elite group. We, we have had uh, three or four couples that have done that in our congregation, you know. Wow. So, I got another one. Yes. So I pull it with my dear friend Jeannie, mm -hmm. and she's had some eye issues. So I'm taking her tomorrow to get her cataract surgery, her first one. So prayers for Jeannie so she can uh, keep on quilting. Yes. And she mentioned that uh, she's a little uneasy, but yes, in our prayers. And also um, her husband, Bob, who has been. Um, a miraculous healing and progress along the way. Still has some ways to go. And I had a, a consultation, uh, Zoom, or a, an online conference about potential surgeries um, in in the future. There, so it will be a an eventful week for the Johnsons. So glad to have you uh, back with us. Other celebrations or praises. Okay. Um, then may we be in a. Oh, I do have a praise. Yes. Uh, Elaine uh, Huselton's uh, brother uh, has been in our prayers uh, and he received uh, an infusion, blood infusion, and is uh, doing much, much better this week. So she shared that praise uh, her brother Randy in our first service as well. May we be in a spirit of prayer and may our Lord be with you. Yes. Yes. Loving God, healing God, Redeemer God, 
ever-present God. We thank you for this time to share praises. We thank you for this time to uh, celebrate the resurrection as we do every Sunday. Throughout our days during the week, perhaps we have uh, frustrations, definitely concerns. And through this time together, uh, we know that your spirit uh, your spirit will be there to guide us and, and help us when we need to be lifted up. Comfort us uh, when we need to find solace. We thank you for being with us uh, every moment, Lord. We thank you also for that gift of forgiveness that uh, aligns us once more into the right relationship with you, giving us again the joy of our salvation as King David noted that in his, uh, in his songs. So Lord, we, we bow in worship, we lift our hearts, we sing, we listen, we receive encouragement and grace. Perhaps there are others uh, on our hearts to share with our prayer concerns. Tina? Um, on a Friday night, uh, there's a young man who I, people might be familiar with. He owns his own food truck and went to different events. It was a my, uh, my Oberon food event in Nightville. He left and went to the store to pick up some fried ones. Oh, yes. Young family, yes. Mike uh, Ledford, that's a D-F-O-R-D. There's a GoFundMe out there because I have confidence in him. Is it Mike Ledford? Yeah, L E D F O R D. So there's a GoFundMe out there, and I just pray for the young family, the two young kids, and the young wife, and, and uh, Jack and Jack. Still mm -hmm. friends with you, uh, Mike Ledford. Lord, our hearts are saddened uh, for the family of Mike Ledford as uh, his untimely uh, death impacts uh, so significantly and, and we pray that you will sustain the family and the friends in the days ahead. Lord, 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 Lord. Lord. Yes, Debbie? Um, a previous employee of mine and her mother still works for me, um, Courtney Frederick. She's 30 and she's been diagnosed with very unusual cancer and they've given her about four months to live. She has a six-year-old son. Mm -hmm. Lord, we pray for uh, Debbie's employee, Courtney Frederick, and and her family in, in facing a, um, a critical, serious uh, cancer in the days ahead. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. Yes, Audrey? Lord, we pray for Emily and uh, her uh, recovery from, from COVID. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. And also continue in prayers for Colton, our grandson. Uh, he's got that silent asthma, but things have been happening with his heart. And Terry's been taking care of Colton all the time to help him. Lord, we pray along with uh, Audrey and Ken and, and their family for her grandson Colton and um, the many health concerns that he faces. Lord, Lord hear our prayers. prayers. Loving God, healing God, eternal God, ever-present God. Thank you for the ways in which uh, you come into our lives and, 
and give your peace and comfort, your redemption. We continue in prayer. And our hearts are lifted up as we remember uh, your words that you showed the disciples about uh, praying to the Father. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Looks like you have your place at the piano, Mary. encyclopedias of music that I grew up with. I've got about 20 of them. They weigh a ton. <laughs> but they have all kinds of music that I really love and I really love classic. This is all I knew about Disciples of Christ before I came here. It's a fellowship songbook. Let us sing. And so, believe it or not, we've done some of these songs I got a robe and this and that. It's a little teeny tiny thing. And um, I've had that for 20 years or something longer, maybe. And um, as I was preparing to come here today, um, my mind said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I thought, that's why I like it here. Uh, the song I'm playing today is called Leave Us Strong by Franz Liszt, and I'm only going to play a little bit of it because, you know, the yoke is easier than the other. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our scripture reading this morning is Mark, Mark 9, verses 2 through 13. Um, you can either follow along um, on your bulletin, or if you'd rather, you can look on page 44 in the New Testament of the Pew Bible. Mark 9, 2 through 13. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written about him. Before I get into my message, I have a, uh, a Super Bowl <coughs> joke about the Super Bowl of the animal kingdom. And science were divided up between the large animals and the small animals. And at halftime, literally, the small animals were being tromped on by the, the larger animals. The coach for the, uh, the small animals gave us during halftime talk, and by golly, they came out. In the first series, they stopped the large animals. First, the rhino tried to come up the middle, and he was stopped at the line of scrimmage. Second play, the hippo was trying to do a, a slant, and he was also stopped at the line of scrimmage. Well, then the elephant was the third play, and he was just going to roll, roll over everybody. Sweep, swiping the animals out of the way with his trunk, but amazingly, he was caught five yards behind the line of scrimmage. So the triumphant small animals came off the field, and the coaches, man, that was great! But it's hard to see who stopped the uh, the rhino. Centipede said, well, well, I did that. Well, who stopped the hippo? Centipede, I, I did that one too. And I said, well, how about that elephant? Was that you too? He goes, yeah, yeah, it was. Just, what, what were you doing during the first half then? And he said, well, you know, it takes a long time to get my ankles taped. <laughs> <laughs> so, har, 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 yeah, yeah. So, some of life is memorable and we call some of those events that we remember mountaintop experiences sometimes however the disasters make us feel like well the mountains on top of us throughout the bible there were some of these experiences where the uh, the people felt like they're on top of the mountain and then not to uh, too long later, they were underneath the mountain. Like uh, on Mount Moriah, Abraham felt that God was calling him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham surely felt at that moment that the mountain was on top of him. But then God opens his eyes to see a ram that was caught in the thicket, and soon, soon Abraham was on top of the mountain. Mount Sinai. Moses received the Ten Commandments. 
Certainly that was a mountaintop experience, but when he came down from the mountain, oh, the people were in rebellion. They had cast a golden idol shaped in the form of a calf, and they were all indulging in vile practices and activities. Moses was with the mountain on top of him. On Mount Carmel, Elijah had the greatest contest with the prophets of Baal and won a spectacular victory. He was on top of the mountain, but right after that, he was on the run, thanks to wicked Queen Jezebel. And he ended up hiding in a cave where he felt the weight of a mountain was on his shoulders. If we look at Jesus' life, quite a few times there, one of the temptations that Christ endured took place on a high mountain. I will say that temptation can find us anywhere, whether on a high mountain or whether in a valley of doubt or despair. But after that temptation experience, Jesus had other memorable experiences. It was on the top of the Mount of Olives where he retreated for prayer. It was also the place where he was betrayed. And who can forget Christ's sermon on the Mount? Perhaps the most enduring teaching of all of his sermons Important events often happen upon mountains in our scriptures that we have. And certainly today's lesson from Mark's gospel is one of the ultimate mountaintop experiences. Mark tells us that the, the event occurred six days after something that happened. That's kind of a mountaintop experience too. In chapter 8, we uh, find Jesus asking the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter, Peter got it right. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah. And Jesus had to be thinking to himself, yes, thank you, Peter. But then he told the disciples on, about what was going to happen to him. And Peter was a bit like that. He says, no, no, that can't happen to you. And Jesus told him and rebuked him. He says, get behind me, Satan. Because he realized that that wasn't the spirit talking to Peter. That was Satan's little uh, whisper to his ear. So Peter had the mountaintop experience and then the valley experience. And then six days later, this happens. Jesus, I guess, had... Uh, resolved the issue with Peter, and he took James and John along with Peter up on a mountain. Those three had to be thinking, okay, this ought to be a nice retreat here. Not only all of us alone, but Jesus, this crisp mountain air, we can get our heads clear, and this, this is going to be wonderful. So, the disciples were looking probably forward to a retreat, but that didn't happen. First, they saw a sudden change in Jesus' appearance. He appeared as a brilliant light. As Mark tells it, his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. Sounds like a laundry commercial, doesn't it? Dazzling white. And the disciples knew, okay, we thought Jesus was special, but boy, this is really special. And the word that the scriptures use is transfigured. And disciples saw Jesus as they had never seen him before. At least until they were welcomed into heaven, they would never see him like that again. And then if that wasn't enough, the disciples see Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah. I have always thought to myself, how did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? They'd never seen Moses and Elijah. But somehow within their spirit, they recognized that. Hmm. Now why Moses and Elijah, do you think? Someone besides Joe Stump and John Craycraft probably know this. Why Moses? Why Elijah? Okay. 
<laughs> we'll take this little bit of Bible trivia home with you then, because Moses represented the law, the Torah, okay? Elijah represented the prophets. And we remember Jesus saying something like, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. So they had the big three of Hebrew history and eventually Christian history. Hmm. And they are speechless, pretty much. Mark tells us that Peter said to Jesus, uh, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here, so let's put up three shelters or tents or tabernacles, uh, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He wanted to prolong this event, and when we are uh, up on the mountaintop of the experience, we kind of want to savor the moment, prolong it as much as we can. Mark adds that Peter didn't know what to say, so I guess he just blurted out the first thing in his mind. Have you ever had times in your life where you said something, and after that you go, oh gosh, I can't believe I said that. Well, Peter might have been thinking, oh man, I can't believe I said that. But as it turns out, it really didn't matter. If that wasn't enough, there was more. Mark tells us a cloud appeared and covered them. And then a voice from the cloud came out. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Sounds very familiar to the voice that appeared at Jesus' baptism, doesn't it? This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Yes. So, they likely had been listening to Christ, but if they hadn't, this was a time where they go, okay, we got it. We'll listen to him. I understand. We'll give him our full attention. And I believe that's what God wants from us, our full attention. And you might ask, what if I think I hear God's voice, but I'm wrong? What if I end up somewhere that I'm not where I'm not suited? My opinion is I, I believe that you will find out soon enough and and change your course. I believe the risk is far greater that you will never make a commitment than end up missing out on something that God has for you there. So um this is a time where we think to ourselves, hmm, am I, am I listening to God as much as I really uh, need to, as much as God wants me to? Hmm. There's a classic story about a king of Bavaria in the 11th century named Henry III. Hadn't really heard this story uh, until I uh, read it last week, but King Henry became tired of his responsibilities of king. Maybe we could understand that. It seemed like a lot of work. But he worried of the pressures of international politics, the worldliness of court life, and so he made a major life decision. He went to the local monastery and he talked to the, I guess, the, the monk in charge, the head monk, and the monk listened to him and responded something like this. Your Majesty, you understand that a pledge here is a pledge of obedience. Yes, I understand that. Are you willing to listen to what God would be saying to you? Yes. And the monk said, then I'll tell you what to do. Go back to your throne and faithfully serve in the place where God has put you. Hmm. After King Henry died, a statement was written in his honor, the king learned to rule by being obedient. We like to
to rule our own lives, but the secret to ruling well is being obedient. So, we have the mountaintop experience, we have the three disciples, we have Peter a little bit speechless, just saying the, saying the first thing that comes to his head. We have a voice from heaven, God's booming voice coming down to say, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And listen, they did. Peter, James, and John listened and went wherever God directed them. And that is why we revere their names to this day. Can you imagine where we would be here if Peter, James, and John had not really listened? Hmm. Their witness and their ministries impacted the world. So we are here today. I guess Jesus led them down the mountain. And I guess we can maybe see that also. Jesus said, don't tell people what happened here. Let them find out for themselves. And I suspect those disciples were thinking, gosh, we're in the presence of Moses and Elijah. All we have left now is Jesus. But Jesus was enough. Jesus was enough. And so it is for each one of us. All through scriptures and, and before the Last Supper with the disciples, Jesus was trying to prepare them for what was going to happen. So it was described in Mark's gospel, and they didn't care for that, especially Peter. But when he got to that last supper with them, he tried to be a little more pointed. Here, let's use an object lesson. As he took bread and blessed it, he tore it apart. Okay, this is my body given for you. And I want you to be a part of the ministry that you're going to encounter. So take and eat of this bread, all of you. And a little bit later on, he took a cup and pour wine into the cup. And he said, this is representative of my blood shed for sin. They were familiar with the blood sacrifice. But Jesus went further. This is my blood shed for a new covenant. Things are going to change, people. And as they ate the bread and drank the wine, they reflected upon that as we do today. For every time we eat of the bread and drink of the cup, we remember God's love for each one of us until our Lord comes.
grace today and each time we gather. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your love, a love that is so great that you gave your son, Jesus, to take on our sins and give us eternal life. We ask your blessing on the bread, reminding us of his body, tortured and broken for us. And we ask your blessing on the cup, representing the blood Jesus shed and ushering in the new covenant. May this time of remembrance renew us and strengthen us so that we are able to better serve you in this place that you have chosen for us. This we pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen. And as we do each time we gather, let us share the bread. And drink of the cup together as disciples. James and John were with Jesus on a mountaintop when Jesus was joined by the long dead Moses and Elijah. Peter, even though he was terrified by this visitation, wanted to give something special to Jesus. His offer was to create three tents or dwellings. As followers of Jesus, we want to give something special to Jesus as well. What can we give? We can take the symbols of our lives, portions of the income we have from our allowance, our work, our inheritance, Social Security or pension, and offer those symbol symbols through our morning offering. When we present these gifts, we act out presenting our life itself. How aware are we? Do we grasp how this fleeting life comes as a gift from God? Returning a portion of our lives to the work of this congregation is one way both our church and we, too, are transfigured. Let your light shine today as you make it. or serve the little ones of today. We could build grand facilities or restore neighbors. We could stay on mountaintops or go into the valleys of loneliness with our arms full of grace. May our lives and gifts we offer today be used to increase your work of justice, light, and hope, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Transfigure is not a word we use a lot, is it? If I were in elementary school and the teacher asked me to use the word transfigure in a sentence, I don't know if I could do that. But I do remember somewhere along the way of a verse in the Battle Hymn of the Republic that uses the word transfigured. In the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me as he died to make us holy. Let us die to make all free. For God is marching on. Glory, hallelujah! Glory, hallelujah! Transfigure, it means, I guess, to be changed, a change, a, a changed across from, from something trans and uh, figure. But that's what Christ does for us. He transfigures us. He changes us. And all during our lives, we, we move along. We go from here to, fear, to here. 
to be transfigured as we go. If you've never made a commitment to be part of that transfiguration process, today is a day that you can remember. We talked about transfiguration. Or maybe you're looking to invest your, your time and talent and treasure in, um, in our congregation, part of our ministry. If you have those two choices on your heart, commitments to make, please come as we share our closing hymn, which I don't think we have sung here before. Uh -huh. Can I talk about it a little bit? Yes, talk. Okay. So, we use minor keys in music for sad things. And we use major keys for happy things. But, Picardy, where this uh, music comes from, was the first time that they used a major key after a very somber French melody. They put a major ending on it after the verse to denote the return. It's called the Picardy Third. The Picardy Third. Yeah, so it's not a real pretty thing, but you get the idea. Yes. <laughs> Transforms the word. May we stand together?
believe as the transfigured people of God. Amen. 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 Amen.